Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. The book we are interpreting in this issue is Pedro Paramo. It is a novella written by Mexican author Juan Rulfo. While we may not often hear Rulfo's name, he holds high prestige in Latin American literature and even the world literary stage. He is known as the pioneer of Latin American magical realism literature. Magical realism is a literary technique that uses magical and fantastical elements to depict real-life situations. When it comes to Latin American magical realism literature, many people immediately think of Colombian writer Gabriel Garcia Marquez and his famous novel 100 Years of Solitude. However, if we delve deeper, we will discover that Marquez and other Latin American writers were influenced by Rulfo. During the 1960s and 1970s, Latin America witnessed the emergence of numerous outstanding literary works that had a profound impact on the world. This phenomenon is known as the Latin American boom in literature. Marquez is one of the representative authors of the boom, while Rulfo is regarded as its pioneer. The work that solidified Rulfo's position in the literary world and brought him fame is Pedro Paramo, which we are interpreting in this issue. This work was published in 1955 and tells the story of a young man who travels to the enigmatic town of Kamala to fulfill his mother's dying wish of finding his estranged father, Pedro Paramo. He encounters a series of eerie events in the town. Although this work is not lengthy and the initial storyline may seem simple, it is hailed as the founding work of Latin American magical realism. Renowned authors such as Jorge Luis Borges and Kenzaburo Oe have spoken highly of it. Even the town of Kalmala from the novel has become a symbol of Mexican local culture. Why is that? In other words, why does Pedro Paramo possess such great artistic charm? This leads us to the narrative structure Rulfo employed, his writing themes, and how he infused the work with magical elements. Don't worry, we will discuss these questions in detail in the third part of our interpretation. So, today's interpretation consists of three parts. In the first part, we will get to know Rulfo's life, his writing themes, and techniques. In the second part, we will delve into the plot of this novella. In the third part, we will explore the artistic charm of Pedro Paramo and where it originates from. Part 1. Let's begin by briefly exploring the life of Juan Rulfo. In 1917, Rulfo was born in a small town in central West Mexico, into a wealthy landowner family. However, Rulfo's childhood was unfortunate. At the age of six, his father was killed during the Mexican Revolution, and four years later, he lost his mother as well and had to enter an orphanage. He later lived with his grandmother. As an adult, Rulfo had a shy and reserved personality. He was a typical introvert not only in his personal life but also in his works, rarely revealing his own thoughts and feelings. As a creator, he relinquished the narrative power to the characters in his writing, never taking sides or making value judgments, always maintaining the stance of a clear-minded outsider. In addition to writing, Rulfo possessed many talents. He was a photographer and published several collections of photography. He was also a historian and authored a historical work. He was a skilled translator as well, translating the poems of Austrian poet Rainer Maria Rilke. That's not all. Rulfo was also a screenwriter and collaborated with his close friend, the renowned Mexican director Emilio Fernandez, on multiple film scripts. Interestingly, this multi-talented individual did not receive a formal higher education. Rulfo's success primarily relied on his natural talent and self-education. He would attend literature courses as an auditor while working and extensively read literary classics. He once worked in the Mexican government department responsible for archival classification. This job provided him with opportunities to travel for work, allowing Rulfo to explore various regions of Mexico and gain insights into the local customs and traditions. These experiences not only provided abundant material for his photography but also enriched the subjects for his literary creations. Before writing Pedro Paramo, Rulfo primarily focused on writing short stories. These stories comprehensively depicted the rural landscape of Mexico, to the extent that some say Rulfo captured the essence of rural themes entirely. 
Some of these stories narrated the struggles of Mexican peasant revolutionary forces against exploitation. Others portrayed the class oppression and injustice prevalent in rural Mexico. While some explored poverty, backwardness, and the ignorance of the rural population. These stories were later compiled into a collection titled The Burning Plain, published in 1953. Rulfo's experience in writing short stories made his writing style incredibly concise. Two years later, Rulfo published his masterpiece, Pedro Paramo, which solidified his position. However, he never wrote another novel after that. In 1976, Rulfo was elected as a member of the Mexican Language Academy. Ten years later, he passed away due to lung cancer. We know that Rulfo lacked formal higher education, and his literary output is limited. So why does the literary criticism community unanimously regard him as the trailblazer of the Latin American literary boom? To explain this question clearly, we need to turn our attention back to the tumultuous Latin American continent in the first half of the 20th century. Prior to this period, including Mexican literature, the entire Latin American literary scene, although constantly accumulating and developing, always remained subordinate to European literature, unable to break free from the European literary models. In 1910, a significant event took place in Mexico, which was the bourgeois democratic revolution. This revolution overthrew the 30-year dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz. The initial intention of the revolution was to seek land equality rights for the Mexican peasant class but resulted in significant civilian casualties, leaving the nation with indelible wounds. Subsequently, a series of major historical events unfolded. Starting from 1930, the capitalist world experienced an economic crisis, followed by the Spanish Civil War and the onset of World War II. These significant historical events seemed to suddenly awaken a small group of Latin American writers. The accumulation of their literary endeavors reached a critical point where quantity transformed into quality. As a result, in the 1940s and 1950s, the Latin American literary scene began to reveal a new atmosphere, with some writers embarking on the path of creating Latin American national literature, including Juan Rulfo. We know that Rulfo was Mexican. Specifically within Mexico, after the end of the revolution, the country's literary scene had two major creative trends. The first trend involved writing novels about the Mexican Revolution using traditional creative techniques. At the same time, many Mexican writers were influenced by European modernist literature, drawing inspiration from various innovative artistic techniques. They were eager to break with tradition and seek novelty and change. This represented the second creative trend. Rulfo's works found a balance point between these two creative trends. Mexico had been a former colony of Spain, but Rulfo broke away from the traditional literary models of Spanish literature. He employed avant-garde writing techniques to rewrite the local stories of Latin America. In fact, there were other Latin American writers before him who wanted to write in a similar manner, but few achieved the same level of success as him. As for why he achieved such remarkable accomplishments, don't worry, we will discuss it in detail in the third part. Rulfo's works had a tremendous impact on Latin American writers, particularly his influence on Gabriel Garcia Marquez is widely discussed. Marquez once mentioned that the night he first read Pedro Paramo, he couldn't resist reading it again before going to sleep. He claimed that he could recite the entire novel and even pinpoint which page each story appeared in the copy he read. It was Rulfo's work that allowed Marquez to find a persuasive and poetic writing style, continuing his own creative path. Part 2 Now, let us step into the magical world of this novel. The story begins from the perspective of a young man from a Mexican town. The young man's name is Juan Preciado. He grew up with his mother staying at his aunt's house, and never knowing who his father was. Before his mother passed away, she urged him to find his father. She told Juan that his father's name was Pedro Paramo and that he lived in a town called Kamala. On a day in August, Juan set out on his journey to find his father. When he was nearing Kamala, he met a mule driver named Abundiel who happened to be heading there too. Juan decided to accompany him on the journey. As they traveled, they chatted along the way. Through Abundio, 
Juan learned that his father lived in a large estate called Hacienda Media Luna and was one of the major landowners in the area. What surprised him even more was the revelation that Abundio was also the son of Pedro Paramo, and their father had passed away years ago. When they reached a crossroad, Abundio suggested that once Juan reached his destination, he should go find a boarding house landlady named Ejevages Diada, who could provide him with a place to stay. After arriving in Kamala, Juan followed the sound of flowing water in the river and found the house of Ejevages Diada, located by the river. He raised his hand to knock on the door but found it already open, mysteriously swinging open as if blown by the wind. Ejevages Diada was waiting at the door and she led Juan past a row of dark empty houses to a house that had already been prepared for him. Ejevages Diada told Juan that she had just received a message from Juan's mother, informing her that Juan would come here. Juan was puzzled and questioned how his deceased mother could have sent a message. Strangely, Ejevages Diada showed no surprise and, with a sudden realization, said, no wonder her voice sounded so weak. By this time, it was late at night, and the lamp suddenly went out. Ejevages Diada left, leaving Juan alone in the room. In between sleeping and waking, Juan suddenly heard the sound of a drunkard calling out for help, but when he sat up and listened carefully, the voice disappeared. As he fell asleep again, the calling sound reappeared. At that moment, the door swung open, and a strange woman appeared at the doorway. The woman told Juan that her name was Damiana and she lived in Pedro Paramo's Hacienda Media Luna. She was the one who delivered Juan at birth. She informed Juan that the calling sound was the ghost of a man who was strangled to death in this room. After his death, the doors and windows of the room were sealed until his body became rigid. It was said that this way his body would never find eternal rest. Damiana also revealed to Juan that Ejevages Diada had actually died a long time ago, and her spirit was probably still suffering. Juan was greatly frightened by all this and decided to follow Damiana and leave. But as they were passing through the village, Damiana suddenly vanished into thin air. Juan stood alone on the empty street, and he noticed that the windows of every house were wide open, and the houses were overgrown with weeds. After a while, someone tapped Juan on the shoulder and led him into a house. The roof of the house had collapsed halfway, and the floor was scattered with broken bricks and tiles. Inside the half-roofed house, there lay a man and a woman on a bamboo bed. Juan learned from their conversation that the couple was, in fact, siblings. Exhausted both physically and mentally, Juan decided to rest temporarily in this house. Later, when the husband didn't return after a long search for a lost calf, the wife asked Juan to sleep on the bamboo bed to avoid being eaten by ticks on the floor. After arriving in Kamala, Juan encountered various strange events, and his consciousness gradually became blurred, and his memories faded away. He obediently followed the woman's instructions and slept on the bamboo bed. At midnight on that day, Juan woke up on the bamboo bed, drenched in sweat, feeling restless and overheated. He went out to the street hoping to find some cool breeze. In the stifling heat of August, the air became stagnant and thin. What was most chilling was that although the streets were empty, countless whispers permeated from all directions, converging around Juan and ultimately killing him. When Juan woke up again, he found himself buried in a grave. In the same grave, there was a deranged beggar woman named Dorotea. Juan calmly accepted the fact that he was already dead. Even though he lay underground, he could still hear the whispers coming from all sides. Dorotea, the beggar woman, told Juan that these whispers were from the deceased, and once they were affected by the dampness, they would turn over and wake up. After carefully listening to these voices, Juan discovered that these dead people seemed to have some kind of connection to his father, Pedro Paramo. Amidst the monologues and recollections of these dead individuals, the life story of the estate owner Pedro Paramo gradually became clear. Pedro Paramo was born into a declining estate owner's family. His father was named Tangelo Paramo and didn't have a high opinion of his son Pedro, considering him lazy and worthless. Later, Tangelo was mistakenly killed at a wedding while serving as the witness. After his father's death, Pedro Paramo inherited the heavily indebted Hacienda Media Luna. From then on, he resorted to various vile means, seizing and plundering, 
exploiting men dominating women, eventually becoming the ruler of Kamala, where his illegitimate children were scattered everywhere. In the novel, Pedro Paramo once said to his steward, Teal Fulger, forget about laws, Fulger. From now on, we will be the ones making the laws. Pedro had henchmen who specialized in abducting young women for him, stewards who specialized in seizing other people's lands and properties, corrupt lawyers who specialized in removing legal obstacles and cleaning up messes, and dedicated enforcers. Juan, a young man who came to search for his father, is actually the son of one of the creditors of the Hacienda del Consuelo. Pedro Paramo, the owner of the Hacienda, married Juan's mother and seized her property. After their marriage, he subjected her to various forms of torture, which eventually led her to leave and die with bitterness in a distant land. Pedro Paramo was a ruthless and cunning person. When his father was mistakenly killed at the wedding, he didn't bother to investigate the truth and instead indiscriminately killed almost everyone who attended the event. Furthermore, Pedro Paramo was extremely sly. When impoverished peasants who took up arms against him sought him out, he pretended to be accommodating, offering money and manpower. However, secretly he instructed his henchmen to join forces with 300 young men against the peasants, seizing leadership. Later, he partnered with a peasant army from another village and expanded the force from 300 to 700. Pedro Paramo's principle was simple and brutal. Whoever wins, he joins them, and then they find a village and target wealthy families to loot. Pedro Paramo's cruelty was also inherited by his other son, Miguel Paramo. Miguel forced himself upon young women, and it was the beggar woman Dolores Sombro mentioned earlier who arranged these encounters. There was a priest in the village of Kamala whose brother was killed by Miguel, and his niece was raped by him. Despite the influence and temptation of Pedro Paramo's power and money, the priest reluctantly provided services to Miguel. Perhaps due to divine justice, Miguel eventually lost his life in a horse-riding accident. While Pedro Paramo was cold-blooded and ruthless, he also had a tender side towards those he loved. The person he loved was Susanna, his childhood sweetheart. His infatuation with Susanna lasted for decades, like an obsession. Many years ago, Susanna left with her father and married another man. After becoming a widow, Susanna's father took her back to live with him, where he molested her. Due to her husband's death and her father's abuse, Susanna became mentally unstable. Despite this, Pedro Paramo continued to inquire about Susanna's whereabouts. When he finally found her, he secretly had Susanna's father killed in order to marry her and keep her by his side forever. Susanna, on her deathbed, finally released herself from her suffering. Her death was a heavy blow to Pedro Paramo. He completely broke down and lost interest in everything. When he realized that the other villagers were not as grief-stricken as he was, he swore to seek revenge on the entire Kamala. He abandoned his land, had the farming tools burned, and expelled all his family members from the hacienda. From that time on, the land became abandoned and turned into ruins. Pests spread, and the village was left in ruins as the villagers scattered in different directions. As for Pedro Paramo, he spent his days sitting alone in a leather chair at the entrance of the hacienda, watching the road where people took Susanna's body to the cemetery. Every day, a part of him would die until one day, he collapsed heavily to the ground, and his body crumbled like a crumbling mountain. Part 3 of the story you just heard was actually narrated to you after we organized the novel's timeline and clarified the story's structure. Although this novel is not lengthy, it is not easy to unravel the plot. The entire book is divided into 69 fragments, with time and space fragmented, and each character's life shattered. Each fragment follows a different timeline, and the narrative perspectives constantly change. The identity of the narrators is rarely hinted at by the author, so when we read the novel, we can only make judgments based on the narrator's language style and specific dialogue. Therefore, many people often feel puzzled when they read this novel for the first time. In fact, this fragmented arrangement is one of the artistic charms of Pedro Paramo. Next, let's take a closer look at where the artistic charm of Pedro Paramo lies. Typically, novels follow a chronological narrative, with a complete and clear storyline. In contrast, the story in Pedro Paramo is disjointed, 
sometimes delving into the past and sometimes depicting the present. The stories also intertwine with each other, creating a complex yet self-contained microcosm. By adopting this form, Juan Rulfo allows readers to no longer passively accept the author's narration but to actively engage in the work and form a collaborative relationship with the author. Take the life story of Pedro Paramo as an example. His story does not unfold to readers in a complete and monotonous manner. Instead, readers approach this character from multiple directions to understand his life. This fragmented storytelling undoubtedly leaves many gaps, but it is precisely these gaps that expand the possibilities of the story and increase the freedom of interpretation. Reading such a novel is not only a challenge but also a pleasure. With each subsequent reading, through extensive mental activity, readers will experience moments of sudden enlightenment, gaining a novel reading experience of dispelling the clouds to see the moonlight, which is exactly what Rulfo intends to offer every reader. Furthermore, the artistic charm of Pedro Paramo is also reflected in its themes. In Rulfo's works, there are two common themes, father-son relationships and guilt. Let's first examine the theme of father-son relationships. We know that the young Juan, following his mother's will, went to the town of Kamala to search for his estranged father, Pedro Paramo. This is a journey to find his father. Patricide and paternal search are two deeply ingrained plots in Western culture, both originating from ancient Greek mythology. Patricide symbolizes the transition from old to new, while paternal search symbolizes the quest for the spiritual homeland or roots. Regardless of how the environment changes in later life, the traits of many ethnic groups are passed down through generations, hidden in their blood and bones. The town of Kalmala in the novel carries symbolic significance. It is not only an unnamed town on the Latin American map, but also symbolizes the Latin American continent's lack of discourse and influence on the world stage at that time. For all Latin Americans, their fathers symbolized the Spanish conquerors who came to this continent, engaged in rape and plunder, committed atrocities, and ultimately departed, leaving behind a desolate land and the awkward identity of illegitimate offspring. The theme of paternal search adds a mythological dimension to Pedro Paramo. We can say that this work is also a contemporary myth that looks back at Mexico's rise and fall over a hundred years, searches for the soul of the Mexican nation, and even encompasses the collective memory of the entire Latin American people. Another common theme in Rulfo's works is guilt, which is vividly portrayed in Pedro Paramo. Pedro Paramo, who is brimming with evil, is actually a representative figure of a certain type of people in Mexico known as caciques, which refers to despots or local tyrants. Caciques employ violent means to gain benefits and exercise control, and their tyrannical rule has brought calamity to rural Mexico. Rulfo's hometown, like the town of Kamala in the novel, suffered from caciquismo, and fertile and abundant land turned into barren wasteland and ruins. In the novel's Kamala, not only is the land wasted and the environment harsh, but the hearts of people have also become corrupted, and various forms of sin prevail. For example, as mentioned earlier, Pedro's beloved Susanna, who was originally his half-sister, was molested by her father, and the innkeeper's wife provides a place for Pedro's steward to commit murder. Another example is Dolores Roa, a beggar woman sharing a grave with Juan, who once confessed that she was the one who helped the delinquent Miguel play around with girls. In the impoverished and harsh living conditions, people's moral standards degrade to self-abandonment and the use of violence to counter violence. Such widespread violence is not something Rulfo imagined but something he personally experienced, reflecting the reality of life. It can be said that through Pedro Paramo, Rulfo portrays the image of a rural Mexican landowner and presents the ignorance, backwardness, and savagery of rural Mexico during that period. In a place where the law of the jungle prevails, regardless of one's social status, anyone can become the side of evil. In addition to fragmented narration and profound thematic exploration, this novel has another aspect that captivates readers. It completely blurs the boundaries of life and death even reaching a point where the distinction between humans and ghosts disappears. Clearly deceased individuals can converse, reminisce, and narrate past events just like living people. At the beginning of the novel, it is explained that the young man, Juan, 
returns to his hometown of Kamala after his mother's death, hoping to find his estranged father, Pedro Paramo. However, upon arrival, he discovers that everyone he meets has actually died many years ago, including himself. Regarding this setup, Rulfo once said, All the characters are dead. This is a monologue novel, and all the monologues are delivered by the dead. In other words, the novel begins with the dead telling their stories. The one who starts telling his own story is a dead person, and the one listening to the story is also a dead person. It is a dialogue between the dead. The village is also a dead village. This concept of blurring the boundaries between life and death, where humans and ghosts are indistinguishable, is not unique to Rulfo but shared among Mexicans. They believe in the cycle of life and death, where death is seen as another form of life, and the living and the dead are connected. Deceased loved ones can also celebrate festivals with the living, as seen in the famous Mexican Day of the Dead. By giving voice to the deceased, Rulfo not only infuses the entire work with a magical quality but also showcases the application and display of local customs and culture. In this novel, regardless of how absurd and fantastical the storyline becomes, Rulfo's tone remains calm and unaffected. This magical realism approach of narrating astonishing events with a poker face has greatly influenced Latin American writers like Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Although Rulfo left behind only a small body of work, whenever we encounter magical realist literary works, we can feel the profound impact he has had on literature. So, this is the essence of the novel Pedro Paramo we have discussed. Let's review today's key points. Firstly, the Latin American literary scene in the 20th century was filled with shining stars, and Mexican writer Juan Rulfo was undoubtedly one of the most brilliant ones. In the early 20th century Mexican literary scene, Rulfo found a balance between two creative trends in his literary works. He used innovative writing techniques to rewrite the history of Latin America, becoming a leader in the Latin American literary explosion. Secondly, Pedro Paramo is Rulfo's masterpiece, highly acclaimed by critics. The artistic charm of this novel comes from two aspects. Firstly, its fragmented narrative structure. The storylines in Pedro Paramo are fragmented, jumping back and forth between the past and the present, interweaving different narratives. In this structure, readers establish a collaborative relationship with the author, actively participating in the work rather than passively receiving the author's storytelling. Secondly, the novel explores profound themes, with father-son relationships and guilt being frequent subjects in Rufo's works. The theme of paternal search adds a mythological dimension to Pedro Paramo, while the portrayal of guilt in the novel reveals the consequences of violence in rural Mexico. Lastly, the concept of blurring the boundaries between life and death, where Rulfo allows the deceased to speak, not only fills the entire work with a magical quality but also showcases Mexico's local customs and culture to the readers. If we open this work, we will discover that the characters in the novel rarely have substantial actions. Most of the time, they are merely contemplating and reminiscing, conveying their fears, hatred, and regrets, dying and dying again. Throughout the entire novel, there are no specific coordinates or faces, whether in terms of time, space, or characters. However, what is remarkable is that despite this, the work still leaves a very real impression on the reader. For example, Gabriel Garcia Marquez once said that he was familiar with every characteristic of each character in this novel. This may be because Rulfo's visual style in his work is incredibly strong, and the symbolism is extremely intense. If you are interested in magical realism works, I recommend you seek out the original book Pedro Paramo to read. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.